The campaign to save Knock Ivey centres around a neil ethic round cairn DOW 041022, which measures 100 feet in diameter and is located at the top of the hill of Knock Ivey, and that's in South Down. The name of the hill recalls the Ullad tribe, the Avaka Kubo, who resided in this part of County Down. The name means the descendants of Eku. Their descendants were the McGuinness, the Makangas, the McGuinness chieftains of Ivey. The Knock is an isolated prominence of modest height situated at the centre of a geological bowl. From it, fantastic views in all directions can be obtained. The cairn appears to have been one of many in the vicinity opened by Mr Isaac Glenny of Newry in the 19th century. And there were local reports that a crock was removed and other objects taken away by horse and cart. The cairn was partially excavated in 1954 by Pat Collins and the subsequent report was published in the Ulster Journal of Archaeology in 1957. Collins reported that in a pre-excavation survey it was noted that rabbits had liberated quantities of plain western carinated Neolithic pottery from the cairn and this cast out on a presumed Bronze Age date. A substantial sub-cairn burnt layer, approximately 10 centimetres thick, containing charcoal, hazelnuts, burnt bone, numerous flint arrowheads and very large quantities of Western Neolithic pottery was later discovered, as well as fragments of two stone axe heads. An area of fire reddened soil was also located, possibly indicating that there could have been burning at the site. Later carbon dating showed this sub-cairn layer to be around 3060 BC. A secondary, likely Bronze Age burial was also discovered, the cremated bones of an adult and a child, along with the remains of a pottery vessel. The remains of at least two or three other individuals were found in the sub-cairn layer and elsewhere in the cairn. In total, 64 pieces of worked quartz were removed and the cairn seemed to comprise a central kist area with curbstones, large curbstones around the outside. The entire cairn appeared to have been deliberately covered in a skin of soil, the external part of which was bright red in colour. This layer also contained pottery. In his report, Collins discusses a number of possible explanations for this sub-cairn layer, and he suggests that it might possibly comprise occupation material. He notes other sites where similar layers had also been discovered, including Lyles Hill in County Antrim, and a, quote, strikingly similar round cairn in Aberdeenshire. Um, and Collins suggests that this is, quote, a problem of the first importance, which could only be resolved through complete excavations of the sites, including Knock Ivey. Referring to Lyle's Hill and Knock Ivey Cairns, Collins stated that if these two cairns can be matched by others of Neolithic date in Ireland, the ancestry of the true Bronze Age round cairns of this country may have to be sought in these Neolithic monuments, as well as the passage grave round cairns of which Newgrange is the most famous example. A number of other archaeological sites exist in close proximity to the Rhine Cairn, including a barrow to the south and a very large enclosure described in the Sites and Monuments Register as an important royal centre or assembly site to the north, and that, uh, there are also two ring ditches to the southeast. So how did such an intriguing and important site become so seemingly forgotten? It appears that in the decades which followed Collins' excavation, very little was done to further his work. The site was scheduled, but no further investigations took place, and while the Cairn remained a popular walking destination for local families, it appears to have been rather forgotten otherwise. In fact, if it were not for the care of a handful of local people, it does appear likely that Knock Ivey's significance would have been completely forgotten. As luck would have it, my father, the former archaeologist and later Archbishop Alan Harper, worked alongside Pat Collins in the 1970s and has long-standing family connections to the area. Without saying too much, during family outings to the Cairn, he let us know that it was both very old and potentially very significant. During repeated family visits to the Cairn, I became concerned at encroaching development very close to the Cairn, which appeared to intrude on the scheduled area, and I wrote to HED expressing this concern. On the 5th of September 2017, while bringing my children home from school, we were all shocked to see diggers and a crane working adjacent to the Cairn right at the summit of the hill. And it was clear by this point that the special place that we all loved and cared about was in immediate danger. And so I sounded the alarm and this ultimately led to the formation of the Friends of Knock Ivey. Early in the campaign, before the group was established, we were advised to contact Eamon P. Kelly, former Keeper of Antiquities at the National Museum of Ireland. 
Ned Kelly took an immediate interest in the protection of Knock Ive, and the group is deeply indebted to the generosity with which he gave his time and experience. He visited the area and conducted extensive field research, culminating in the publication of Knock Ive and Drumbalaroni County Down, Investigation of a Royal Ritual Landscape in Amania 25 in 2020. This work views Knock Ive as the ancients may have. The profile of the hill with its two rounded peaks is reminiscent of other sacred paps or breast-shaped hills. It is an embodiment of the feminine divine, a living landscape to be honoured by its people through the marriage of the king to the land. This sacred undertaking was designed to secure a fertile and fruitful union that would bring about a time of plenty for the people and the crops and animals they relied on for survival. Knock Ive, as the highest point and central focus of the mensal lands of the Avaca, is identified as the likely site of pagan inauguration ceremonies in which the kingship of the tribal chief gained legitimacy from ritual activity carried out on the bones of the ancestors. Kelly highlights archaeological evidence of fires on the summit of Knock Ive, burnt human and animal remains, hazelnuts and lithics as clues to pre-Cairn ritual activity on the hill, and he proposes that this activity was linked to festivals at certain times of the year. Comparisons have been drawn between Knock Ive as a pagan inauguration and assembly site and other known sites such as Awanmaka, Knock Aene, the Hill of Ward, Marsleeve and Crocken Hill. Comparisons drawn by Kelly between Knock Ive and Crocken Hill in County Offaly highlight compelling parallels with the royal domains at Crocken and the civil parish of Drumbalaroni. Kelly suggests that Drumbalaroni constitutes the royal domains of the Kingdom of Avakakova. Kelly's work examines the evidence for Knock Ive as the central point in the mensal lands, identifying a number of other sites, including a nearby potential Enoch site used for gatherings and horse fairs. Ardbrin Bog, where the treasured Ardbrin Horn was found, lies at the boundary of the parish, a liminal place of votive offerings. Interestingly, no early ecclesiastical buildings are recorded within the parish, suggesting it was either avoided by the missionaries or that they were resisted. Kelly compares this to the remains at Tara. Rathfrylan, to the south, was a medieval royal centre, the site of the late 16th century McGuinness Castle and previously an extensive rath. To the east lies Seafin Castle, built in 1252 on the site of an earlier rath or ring fort known as Seafin. On a prominence in Lisnacropin townland adjacent to Knock Ive, there is a large Bronze Age barrow. A flat mound is enclosed by an earthen bank measuring 140 metres in diameter. This has been suggested as the location referred to in Bartlett's map of 1603 as Lisnery, where the McGuinness is made. Kelly suggests that the relocation of the inauguration site of the Avakakova from the summit cairn of Knock Ive to the nearby Barrow is likely to have taken place during a time of transition from paganism to Christianity. During research carried out by the Friends of Knock Ive, a stone chair was identified that had been found near Ballaroni Lake in a bog. Kelly suggests that this could in fact be the inauguration stone mentioned in a communication of 1596 to Lord Deputy Russell as the stone whereon the McGuinnesses were wont to receive their ceremony. Eamon Kelly's work expands what we previously knew about Knock Ive and the surrounding area by creating a complex and multi-layered timeline that places Knock Ive firmly at the centre of an ever-evolving society from the Neolithic to the present day. The illumination of this continuity makes this place all the more valuable to local people who have their own family traditions and stories centred around this hill. The first major threat, which was what kicked off the campaign, was the erection of a telecoms mast on Knock Ive. Our work identified other such masts across Northern Ireland for which we could find no record of planning applications or consents. The second, which is the focus of our campaign, was the building of the unlawful turbine development on Knock Ive. There is planning permission for a turbine on the hill, but planners completely failed to consult the DOE Historic Monuments Unit and so the monument has been completely overlooked throughout the planning process. Long before anything happened on Knock Ive, there was an audit of events surrounding a planning application at the site of a RAF in Waringstown, County Down. That audit resulted in recommendations being made to planning officials 
so as to ensure that such events could never happen again. Since then, and despite those recommendations, in our research we've identified multiple other sites where HED just wasn't consulted. In relation to single wind turbine planning applications and environmental impact assessment regulations, our research shows an inconsistent approach between the different councils and planning departments in Northern Ireland. Turbine developments also require access tracks, electrical cabinets, which can be very large, overhead power lines, and very often extensive underground earthing cabling. The result of this piecemeal approach is that the impact of a single wind turbine development on built heritage cannot be considered in its entirety. This is known as project splitting and it contravenes environmental impact assessment regulations. Some councils believe that some elements of these developments, such as underground earthing cabling, are permitted development, which means there is no scrutiny of those works at the planning stage, including by HED. The almost two kilometres of underground earthing cabling at Nokai Bay was of extremely serious concern. The council was treating it as permitted development. It seems that it was only after our campaign began that consultee responses to developments on Nokai Bay became more robust and they began to acknowledge the significance of the Nokai Bay Cairn and its position in, in terms of a wider historical landscape. In the course of our work, we have found evidence of weak and sometimes missing follow-ups from field warden's reports which recorded scheduled monument damage and only two prosecutions since 1995 under the historic monuments order neither of which was successful. When the alarm was first raised in 2017 that Knock Ivy was being unlawfully developed it was initially done via personal communication and on social media. The Friends of Knock Ive were simply a loose collection of people with a common interest. Some of us knew and loved the hill, some of us had never met and some of us have still never been there, but our shared passion and outrage brought us together. However, outrage isn't enough, it's necessary to do something. And despite the early days of our campaign being a mixture of upset confusion and paranoia, a team of dedicated individuals gradually emerged, bringing together a range of important skill sets and an enduring passion for Knock Ive. We had to learn quickly how to access public information, how to use freedom of information legislation, how to understand complicated planning jargon, and how to cross-reference all of this with information on the historic environment. We had to come to grips with the relevant laws and legislation on planning and heritage, and we had to deal with planners, as well as keeping a careful eye on the hill. We dealt with planning enforcement officers, and we met with um, officers from the Historic Environment Division. We also contacted the Historic Monuments Council, and we now understand via Freedom of Information how deeply indebted we are to them and to their then chair, Gabriel Cooney, for taking such a strong stand on Knock Ive. We also contacted independent archaeologists and began to do our own research. And we wrote endless letters and emails, explanatory documents, social media posts, blog posts. We met with politicians of all colours and creeds and of none at all, over and over and over. We also brought our campaign to some of the tallest hills in Ulster, erecting our banner on Slave Croob and Slave Donard. We also organised public events where we used the arts, word craft, artwork, photography, graphic design, music, pottery, videography and so on to tell the story. Some of us have ended up being on television quite a lot more than we would have liked, giving interviews and sharing our own stories in order to raise awareness of the harm that the unlawful damage of heritage does to people and to communities. In the four years since the campaign to save Knock Ive began, we have bagged several key wins. Most importantly, Knock Ive has now been recognised by experts as an inauguration place and as a place of, quote, national importance in understanding the Neolithic period in Ireland and also as the centre of a royal ritual landscape. The unauthorised broadband mast, which was erected beside the cairn, was refused planning permission and has now been removed. 
In November 2020, ABC Council stated publicly that the turbine is having an unacceptable impact on the setting of the cairn and that it must be removed. In March 2021, they applied for leave to judicially review the decision by the Department for Infrastructure not to become involved at Knock Ive. Obviously, we believe that the turbine must be removed and the cairn reinstated as the most dominant feature of the landscape. But in addition, thousands of years of unimpeded community access to Knock Ive Summit is now, sadly, being prevented by the developers. And this is of huge importance to us. We believe that Knock Ive Cairn is a central feature of a most important ritual landscape and as a potentially very important ancient burial site itself, is deserving of state care. Public access could and should be facilitated in a similar way to its sister hill at Crocken Hill, County Offaly. We believe that despite the heartbreaking way in which our campaign began, we have helped to raise awareness of the importance of protecting the historic environment. And in recent days, we've seen public statements from various political parties in that regard. Continuing research has noted a number of observable solar alignments involving Knock Ive, with significant views both to and from the monument taking place at important dates within the solar year. This research is ongoing, but it is beginning to look like the relationship between Knock Ive and its wider landscape setting may also be underappreciated. A quick look at the screen shows that we have too many crop marks to go through. So we'll run through those which have been added to the SMR and some of those which we believe are the best contenders for addition. During the exceptionally warm and dry summer of 2018, we felt compelled to purchase a small drone capable of taking video footage. After a quick familiarisation with Balor, as we named it, some of the team headed out to the area immediately surrounding Knock Ive. Unbelievably, and as luck would have it, within a few minutes we'd managed to capture crop marks in the field to the north of the Knock. This turned out to be our finest discovery, a bone-like structure which is now recorded as Dye 034128. There are several structures in the local area which are attributed to the McGuinness. We've got Rathfriland Castle, Seafin Castle, so it's perhaps not too far-fetched to surmise that we may have possibly found evidence of a small bone that may or may not have had links to the McGuinness. It's also worth noting that it's located directly facing the Royal Enclosure of Ballybrick. Further drone imagery, this time commissioned from Pack Aerial Media during the same summer, threw up additional features associated with the huge Ballybrick Royal Enclosure, recorded as Dye 041015. The western half of the site was seen to consist of three concentric elliptical ditches. Google Earth historical imagery also suggests there may have once been a central feature. A recent visit by the group found a large mound of stones at that central area and two more mounds at the field boundary which runs through the middle of the site. Most of these stones are of a size that's seen used in burial cairns. Others are suggestive of architectural origin. We're not sure if these stones are the remains of some type of archaeological monument, but they do raise questions. Moving to the south of Knock Ive, drone imagery revealed the continuation of the ditch which encloses the Bronze Age Listener Crop and Barrow and Inauguration Site, recorded as Dye 041078. Our innumerable hours spent using Google Earth's rollback feature also gave us some success in identifying crop marks that have now also been added to the SMR. What appears to be a bivalate wrath was identified to the southwest of Knock Ive. We've recorded it as FKI 8A. A section of curving field boundary which respects the shape of the crop mark supports the wrath suggestion and it's been recorded now as Dye 041093. When using Google Aerial Imagery, we make sure to cross-reference with the early OS maps as we appreciate that often disappeared field boundaries and structures can be somewhat misleading. During a read through an archaeological survey of County Down, the friends noticed a photograph of a fine pair of possibly prehistoric ring ditches the location of which had been forgotten. Using the photograph, Google Maps and local knowledge, we managed to pin down the exact location. It's recorded as Dye 041078. Yet another circular ditched enclosure to the west of Ballyroney was spotted simply by looking out of Anne's kitchen window in the summer of 2018. Our own drone imagery showed a circular enclosure with a narrow ditch. The site sits in an area where remodelling of the course of the river ban has taken place it would have sat much closer to the water previously. There is a local tradition of this field being known as the Round Field, so it may be that something has been visible at some point in history. 
and this is now recorded on the SMR as dye 042093. The next set of crop mark sites are not yet recorded on the SMR. We appreciate that not every such sighting will turn out to be archaeological, but we do think that these are certainly worthy of consideration. FKI 3 shows clearly in June 2018 Google Earth imagery and appears to be a wrath with a possible entrance on the northeast and with radiating field boundaries. It's situated in the field directly to the east of the field containing our bottom like feature and to the west of another recorded wrath. FKI 4 appears in our commissioned aerial imagery as two large circular crop marks immediately to the west of the field containing the bone crop mark. Two smaller circular crop marks appear just to the north. They are also visible on June 2018 Google Earth imagery. We haven't been able to find any evidence of long gone field boundaries or structures that could account for the marks. FKI 5 appears in Google Earth imagery on a number of occasions but the best visible in June 2018. This is a series of circular features on south facing gently sloping land. Each appears to have a small central feature. Again we couldn't find any evidence of other past physical features to which we could attribute the marks. Finally, FKI 11 is remarkably clear in Google Earth imagery. It appears to be a wrath, located to the south of another wrath. It's visible over a number of years, but is quite stunning in the June 2018 image. It appears to have a large outer ditch with a small inner ditch. We think this particular site is most definitely worthy of inclusion in the SMR. That just about sums up the work of the group over the past four years. We have reams of information that which we've gathered over this time and we're very happy to share it if anyone wants to go through it. We'll also do our best to answer any questions you may have. In the early days of this campaign, we were told that those tasked with the protection of our heritage by the government had to remember that they were both archaeologists and civil servants and it seems a very fine line to walk. Crucially, we're not professional archaeologists nor do we have to answer to any government department. This means we can ask the awkward questions. We can challenge the powers that be. We have had to explore and learn and step out of our comfort zones. And we've done it for the love of Nagaive. Telling the story and making it tangible has been crucial in connecting people to our shared heritage and in breathing new life into the embers of Nagaive.